wanted to thank everyone for joining us at this webinar today. Um, before Lane jumps in to absolutely steal the show, I just wanted to introduce who I was uh, so you knew a little bit more about Trellis, myself, and our connection to Lane. So for those of you that don't know, Trellis is a fundraising platform for charities. So we focus on offering the best donor experience and we're specifically really good at virtual galas. So we can do a lot of things, ticketing, silent auctions, live auctions, um, but the live auction and fund a need piece with your live stream, that's definitely what we do best and where we focus. So my role within Trellis is working with all of our fabulous partners, just like Lane. I get to do fun stuff like this, be on the webinars, uh, and hopefully help a bunch of charities in the process find their way to very, very successful virtual galas, which leads me to Lane. So Lane is our fantastic speaker today and is a powerhouse performer. If you don't know what that means, you're going to see in just a second because I guarantee you Lane is going to capture your attention today, just like they do with all of the donors that they work with. So Lane is also the best that I know at pre-event consultation when it comes to fund a need. So Lane has literally not let a single one of their clients have a bad fund a need. So I just saw on Lane's LinkedIn the other day that Lane has helped raise over $1.5 million just since going virtual. And that was an average of over $127,000 for each of their mid-sized charities that they were working with. So this is the type of success that we are going to be shooting for with all of the tips that Lane is going to tell you today. So I'm very excited to pass this over to Lane, who has graciously decided to share all of these tips with you. And again, take advantage of the hour that you have with Lane. Put every single one of your questions into the chat. I'm going to do my best to save them so that throughout the webinar and a little bit at the end, we'll have tons of opportunities to answer your questions. So thank you, that's my spiel. Uh, I have one update at the end, but besides that, I'm going to pass it over to Lane. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everybody. I hope you're all having a great day. And my goal is to make your day just a little bit better over the next hour or so. Uh, thank you to Trellis for inviting me to present today. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm thankful to all of you for choosing to spend an hour with us today, uh, knowledge sharing, asking questions, and learning more about this virtual uh, event space, especially when it comes to the all critical fund and need. So as Emily mentioned, we will be taking um, questions during this hour. So keep them going in the chat. All right, where does it all start, my friends? Where does the fund and need start? Where does fundraising start? Fundraising starts with a powerful story. And I love this quote by Simon Sinek so much because truthfully, this few words has impacted every aspect of the work that I do as a charity auctioneer, as a fundraiser, as a gala show host. It has driven every move and every decision. And it's critically important, especially to the fund and need. Another quote that I really, really love um, and that holds me accountable for the work that I do is this quote by Maya Angelou. We always have to keep the why and the impact the focal point when it comes to fundraising. Because when you build empathy in people, when you build compassion in the listener through compare, compelling storytelling, that's when you will inspire giving. When humans connect to each other um, through uh, emotion and human connection, and when somebody is vulnerable telling their story, that's when something very magical in our bodies happens. The brain releases oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. And with these feelings, a lot of things happen. With these feelings, it makes us more trusting. It makes us more generous and more friendly. So we really want to focus on what people feel, not what they hear, because they're not going to remember that. They're going to remember the emotion that they felt 
walking out of that in-person gala or uh, turning off their smart TV after a virtual gala. So the story, how it's told and how, the, how that makes the audience feel is going to impact that audience and move that audience. So today, we are gonna cover off and unwrap five critical steps to achieve virtual victory. And we're also gonna look at a case study uh, of an event that I did back in August with a wonderful hospital foundation. So, and at the end, you guys are gonna get offered a pretty cool um, offer from me as well. All right. So before we dive into uh, virtual fun and neat strategies, we really have to understand the major difference from an in-person event to a virtual event. Like, what is the difference? So I want you to take a look at that top row of pictures. There is me in my pink jacket um, during a fund and need. You can see the reaction. You can see the human connection is there. In the next picture, you can see that the audience is wrapped around me. They are captivated because they're involved with the moment. They're involved with the story. Um, they are drawn in by the personal connection. And you know, when you have that, you create energy in a room and your talent will feed off of that as well. Your host will feed off of that and your auctioneer is going to feed off of that. And what I love about the picture in the center is those folks, they're, they're basically locked into a ballroom. They, they can't go anywhere. They're not going to, right? They are seated. Uh, they are engaged uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to head out the door. So when it comes to goal setting, specifically revenue goal setting in a in-person event, it's pretty easy to do. You can base it on your historical data, but you already, you, you know how many tickets you've sold. You know how many people are going to be in their seats. Um, and you can make data uh, data-driven uh, decisions for the fund and need, for your live auction and so on and so forth. But let's pop down to that second row and let's take a look at those images. And this is the reality of the virtual space right now. The ballroom's empty, kids. <laughs> the, 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 the seats are cold, okay? There's nobody going to in-person events. And I'll be truthfully uh, honest with you, I don't think that we're going to see in-person events in 2021. Um, but the ballroom's empty and it's a different viewing experience because your guests are watching online from home, um, likely alone, maybe with their spouse. Uh, you know, when watch parties were uh, available and, and open with uh, the kind of the, the drawback of the restrictions, great. But most people are sitting behind a computer or in front of their smart uh, TV um, or, in the, the, or they're in a Zoom room. So really, you know, creating human connection is something you have to do. You have to create that feeling. Um, you have to already also remember that that virtual audience is transient. They're mobile. Unlike the audience in the upper picture in the center, they are seated, they are captivated. So audience retention, creating audience retention uh, is key in your virtual event as well. Um, and knowing, just a little tip here, knowing that every minute that virtual event goes beyond that 45 minute mark, you're going to lose up to 10% viewers per minute after that. So the other thing about a virtual space is your audience size is really unknown. You can do all the audience development you want, but really what matters is how many people are logged on and watching on event night. And the great thing is obviously that with virtual, you have a larger geography you can access, but if you haven't uh, marketed this event, if you haven't done all the things you knew, have to do in advance, then nobody's going to know that the show is on and nobody is going to show up. So the more viewers that you have, uh, the more opportunity your organization has to tell their story and creating that human connection through powerful storytelling, a dynamic program will create audience development, uh, excuse me, audience retention, which will then create a captive audience and will help people unite and come together that they are, uh, they're feeling like a community. So 
we're going to move on from there. And there's me in the bottom, uh, alone with one camera person in studio. And there's me above in a group of people. It is a very different animal for sure. So before we carry on, I want to dissect the fund to need a, a little bit for you. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have, uh, you know, uh, included a fund to need segment at your charity gala, but I just want to go over some of the, the the main key points about a fund to need: the art, science, and the psychology of it. So the fund to need, of course, is a special moment. It's a, an an opportunity for your donors to make a direct donation and I call it a gift from the heart uh, where guests give a donation at a level that is meaningful for them their cumulative donations uh, you know uh, come together and fund a defined need the donors receive a hundred percent charitable tax receipt and typically uh, the fund and need ask or the before the charity auctioneer is preceded by a client testimonial this my friends, the fund to need is the most important segment of your show. It is your cause connect. It's your mission moment. And it's your opportunity to create awareness for new guests, new participants. So it's critical um, that, you know, we think about the fund to need as an opportunity for everyone to give, because believe me, everyone has the ability to give. Not everybody wants a live auction and an ugly Afghan from the silent auction. I'm telling you right now. And you, <laughs> and let me tell you, you cannot steward a $20 Afghan, but you can steward a $20 fund to need gift. The fund to need is not just a strategy about dollars today for the organization. It's a strategy to get, grow, and keep donors. It's a long-term donor development strategy. So the greatest and the best fund to needs resonate with guests. They fix a problem. It's something fairly immediate. It's a short-term fix. We need a bus for the kids. We need a new gym floor for the gym. Uh, we need to keep this program going because it's not funded by the government. And it's something that is fairly short-term. It's not for a capital development program. It's not for building the new building in 10 years. The revenue goal must be achievable and reasonable for your room size. And when I say room size, do we know our room size when it comes to virtual? Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so setting realistic and achievable goals is very, very important. And that is a bit of a challenge when it comes to a virtual gala because it may be your first virtual gala and you have no historical data to lean on to make those data-driven decisions. So when it comes to the revenue goal, you're always better off blowing over target than coming in short. Because as I say, people remember what they feel, not what they see. And you never wanna have a situation where your goal is $100,000 and that auctioneer is trying to raise that 100,000 and you end the night up with $55,000. That is a downer. That is just a plain old downer. Your guests will walk out of that space, whether it's the virtual space, whether it's the in-person space, they will walk out of that space going, that was a failure. Our $100 isn't even going to make a difference tonight. So revenue goal setting is extremely important. We want everybody to feel a part of the moment. We want to make sure that those $20 gifts um, um, receive as much appreciation and gratitude as a $2,000 gift. So, you know, typically we look at the revenue goal as relevant to the wallet capacity uh, of your in-person event, how many people you have in the room, what the percentage of giving is going to be, what the average gift is going to be. We can figure that out. It's a little bit different for virtual. When we um, look at uh, our speakers and the ask, I want to say to you that a bland PSA does not inspire giving. It won't. Nor do stats and nor do information. And neither does a grateful patient story delivered by the board chair. 
it's it's not it's not going to work people support people and the essence of the fund to need is obviously to help others who can't help themselves improve their lives through the services programs a charity offers to its community so it's really critical that you have the right people coming together to create the fund to need moment it is not your auctioneers responsibility or role to make that call to action to talk about the organization there is no credibility there whatsoever that is my personal opinion where there is credibility is the voice from the organization and let's take a hospital uh, foundation as an example it's the voice of credibility it's the ceo it's the executive director of the foundation they set the ask up uh, they provide the statistics they give the information and they make that call to action present the challenge then they hand that over to the impact speaker and let's call them the grateful patient who gives their emotional and vulnerable impact story that underpins the ask so perhaps the ask is we need uh, blood pressure monitors and now the client is going to talk about how their blood pressure went way down and the ambulance brought them to the hospital and they thought they were never going to see their kids again and it's connected and it's underpinning the ask and that story is emotional it's moving and then your charity auctioneer follows up responds to that emotion and reiterates the ask and starts drawing those donations from the group of people that are online or in person. All right, let's get into some meat and potatoes, kids. All right, let's start planning for our virtual victory. Like I said, the ballroom's empty. It is empty. Your donors are watching online. They're alone in their homes. They're, they're, they're sipping their margaritas. Um, the kids are screaming in the background. The dog has to go for a pee. Um, it's all chaos. It's seven o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, and you need them to support your cause. Are they going to open up their wallets and give their critical donation? Is it possible? I'm saying yes, it is. So today we're gonna open up uh, some uh, conversation around these five uh, critical prevent strategies that number one are going to mitigate your risk. I like leaving as little to the unknown as possible, kiddos, okay? I wanna know that when I'm walking on stage, we are set poised, ready to go, and we are going to blow over target every single time. So we need to set your charity up for success. We need to set up your fundraising auctioneer for success. So we want to identify factors that build empathy into an inspirational moment. We want to understand the process and why securing those seed donations is critical to fundraising success. We're gonna learn where and how to effectively integrate that fund to need moment into your virtual run of show. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the skills required, um, skills that you should be looking for in your professional auctioneer or professional fundraising host. And we're going to talk about how we prime our guests and get them ready to get. So, as I said earlier, I, I feel very strongly um, that all virtual event speakers must be mission focused. And in your virtual event, you have 45 minutes. It is not, you know, when we think about our in-person events, we think minute by minute, minute by minute, and serve the pork, and serve the beef, and then the this, and then the lane goes up and does that, and then it's the cookie draw, and then it's the ring draw. In a virtual event, it is literally seconds and it's literally second to second, I'm going to say. So your CEO, your host of the show, uh, your sponsors, your performers, I feel very strongly that all of those individuals that are going to be on the screen um, must have mission centric narrative built into their performance. Um, because by the time you arrive at the fund and need, your viewers will understand why they are there. Uh, and this is especially important for first time viewers. You really want folks to understand what the cause is, what the mission is, what the purpose of the event is. We know that at in-person events, there's always a percentage of the room that 
our new guests, second, third generation. Um, now with the ability to go into a bri broader geographic space with virtual, I mean, you could be entertaining and hosting guests from literally around the globe. What is a compelling story? A power for story is a story that will stay with your donor for a very long time, maybe actually forever. Whereas, as I said earlier, a bunch of stats, they, they might be interesting, but they are not going to strike that emotional chord that's needed. Without emotion, your donor is just not going to contribute to your cause. So in virtual events, we are, almost nine times out of 10 reliant on video content to convey a client story. We're not in person. You can't feel them crying on stage. You can't feel the rush of emotion. It is a little bit different when it's on screen. Uh, so we are having to build really quality video content that is going to underpin the ask, uh, create that sense of emotion to create that empathy and to create that, that human connection. Um, so, you know, when it comes to building that story, it's got to underpin the ask. And I mentioned that earlier, it has to be relevant. So I want to give you a very specific example. Um, we're going to talk about a hospice today. Um, the hospice needs through three new patient beds. So your speaker, your client speaker would be someone who has lost a loved one at hospice. They're gonna provide a little bit of their background. They're gonna uh, you know, talk about um, you know, the, the, their loved one, what was the event that happened uh, that led them to hospice. Uh, they're going to talk about how they sat by their loved one's bedside, held their hand, how they laid on that bed, um, how that was a place of comfort for them, um, how they wrapped their arms around their loved one in their last moments when they took their breath, they were on that bed couple, cuddled together. So that story not only underpins that ask for why the beds are so important, it's also creating that emotional human connection. The other aspect, and this is very true, is you would want a, a speaker, a client speaker who is not a professional speaker. I know some of you are saying, oh my gosh, Lane, come on. We, we want somebody to speak really well. Mm, no. Uh, yes and no. Let's just say that. You want somebody who is ready and willing to emotionally share. You want someone that is going to be willing and ready to invest in the time to work with you on their script. What you don't want is somebody saying, you know what, I've been speaking for years, I'm a motivational speaker, you know what, I know what I need to do. Um, yep, um, I'm gonna deliver this speech, it'll be fine. No, I don't believe in um, you know 500 words. No, I'm not gonna do that and then all of a sudden, they go rogue and they go off the pathway. So you wanna make sure that you have an, an everyday person who has had a, an experience at that charity uh, with services or programs that can speak to the, the ask underpin and work with you on delivering that in a very specific way. And what does that mean? That means 500 words or less. It literally does. And that's about three minutes. So what you will do, and this is what I do, is I actually spend time with that client speaker, that impact speaker. I talk about what it is that that moment looks like, what it is that we're asking for, and what the purpose of the event is and what their role is. And I help them with their scripting. I absolutely do. So what I normally do is I say, send me your story. Don't worry about 500 words. Do it in 800 or less because I want to see how they speak, their, their grammatical um, process, because I don't want to unauthenticate their words. I don't want, I, I can, I've written thousands of direct mails in my life. I can do that very easily, but that, those are Lane's words. We need to hear from that client speaker so we understand their story completely and how they would go about delivering it. And from there, I work with them on editing it down to about 500 words. 
Um, and what all is also happening during that process is we are developing our own relationship and a relationship with the development team as well, which also brings down the anxiety level for these client speakers as well. They feel supported, um, they, they, they trust, um, and when you have that, then they share and they're, they're willing to do what they need to do so that the charity has the utmost success. Um, so once you have that script, then it's time to connect with your videographer and creating taking that story and then inserting some B-roll. And what that means is supporting graphics and images. Instead of watching your client speak for three minutes from that chair back there, you're going to overlay uh, uh, pictures of their loved one, um, family trips with their loved one, um, maybe their hands holding. So you're adding in graphics, you're adding in strong visuals, you're adding in a music track that is going to emote emotion, I guess, if we want to say it that way. And there are videographers out there. So please go find yourself a videographer or company that specializes in these charity storytelling videos. You know, we, we want to take this first person testimonial, um, the situation that this human was in, and we need to create with the video, the music, the graphics, something that is going to completely move someone. So just think about yourself when you're watching a movie and uh, you know it comes to a very poignant point. And I know all of you have cried through a movie at one point or another in your life. And you think about what it is that makes you move to that place. So the other speaker, of course, that I mentioned is the organizational speaker. They're the ones that are doing the setup. They're the credibility. They're the voice. They're the doc. They're the, um, you know, director of nursing, whoever it is. And, um, you know, they are going to set that person up. It's their responsibility in the fund to need uh, segment. Here is what we do. Here is why we do it. Here's the problem, we're short on cash because we need three new beds. Um, we have you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that pass through the doors of Hospice Wellington. Here is Beth to share her story. So it's, it's building all of those pieces and getting all of that ready because there are many, many facets to the fund and need. It's not just like, hey, Lane shows up and just like starts raising money. Uh, this is work that is done months, weeks in advance planning. So we've got our script, we've got our story, we've determined the ask, we've got our client speaker, we've got our organizational representative, everything is humming along. What do we need next? We need seed donations. Um, if, if I could see you all, I'd say, how many of you know what a seed donation is? Or another way to call it is pre-committed donations. Um, this is crucial, kids. It is absolutely 100% necessary. Um, and, you know, let me talk a little bit about what this is. When we have an in-person event and we have, uh, a, let's say, a $100,000 fund and need goal, and we have 300 people in the room, we know most of those are couples. That means we have 150 giving units. We know what our average gift is. Um, but here's the thing. People are like little sheep. You know, it's interesting. They see one person do something, then they want to get on board. They see somebody else put a paddle up, then they want to get on board. They like to see who's giving and they like to follow suit. So the purpose of pre-committed donations is to have some of those pace setter donors at some of those higher levels get the motivation started. You know, here's a $100,000 goal, who wants to start off with 10,000? And boom, Molly and John put their hand up. Yay, there we go. We are off to the races and let's just keep on going. We're already a 10th of the way there. Let's go. Every donation makes a difference. Blah, 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 blah. Excellent. For an in-person event, when Lane is on site, Lane is down on that ballroom floor. I'm kissing heads, hugging babies, high-fiving people. There's peer 
peer pressure, what I call peer pressure, that is created on the ballroom floor because you're sitting at a table with eight or 10 people. And then people get on board. They see those paddles. They see those hands go up. They see the fundraising technology on that massive PowerPoint. So even then, I suggest to my clients to make sure that you have about 40% of your overall revenue goal pre-committed because Lane does not do failure. And my clients don't do failure either because I would rather have them blow over the target and everybody go, wow, that was amazing than come up short ever. When it comes to virtual, I'm, I'm going, <laughs> this might hurt. This might hurt, it might be a little bit of a gulp moment, but what I am pushing my clients to do, and they're doing it, is to pre-commit 75, at least 75% in advance, okay? Because here's the thing, you don't know how many people are going to be actually watching, you really don't know. And so you can create this fund a need, uh, uh, moment in your virtual cam uh in your virtual event almost like an a, a campaign on um, almost unto itself so building up the seed money is incredibly incredibly important um so and that means building up seed money at various levels um if it's a hundred thousand dollar goal you know a couple of tens a few fives some 25 some thousands i'll even take the 500s that is all great not a big problem at all it's really important for your fundraising host to know something's going to come up on that screen. I can't stand there for 15 minutes. I mean, I'd love to, and I can fill airtime like nobody's business, but in a 45 minute, sh 45 minute show, there's a lot of work to be done in a very short period of time. And if I watch that trellis site, and I don't see any names coming up and I'm waiting for people to get logged on and fiddling with their phones, we, nothing is going to generate. So those pre-commits are gonna fly on that screen and I'm gonna start recognizing those names and it's going to build the excitement. Trust me, it builds the adrenaline, it builds the connection. I'm calling out recognizable names um, and it's building that momentum. Uh, you need help securing that. If you're a small development team, then you certainly should be leaning on your board members, uh, your auction committee, um, your sponsors can help with that in advance as well, your VIPs, your champions of your organization. And I do want you to think, you know, when it comes to uh, how do you go after seed money, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Think about it like, in the same terms as you segmenting your direct mail list. Okay, you're gonna be working with a similar similar process. Uh, matching gift is a great opportunity. Obviously, um, you know, it can be a dollar to dollar match, uh, start to finish, or it can be inserted at some point uh, based on a certain level. Um, so, you know, that is a great way to catapult the fundraising. So if the goal is 100,000, and I say, okay, we got a gift from ABC Insurance Company. They are gonna kick off our fundraising. They have stepped up with a $50,000 gift. Let's load that trellis site right now. Yeah, 50,000, up she goes. So now folks watching are going, oh my gosh, we gotta raise 50,000 and this other 50,000 is gonna be 100,000. Just like that. A match gift can be from one donor. Maybe it's two, maybe there's two uh, companies that came together, $25 each. However it is that you wanna look at it. It's really important to preload these seed dollars, as I just said, because if I have a list of pre-commits, John, Mary, Joe, Bethy, and Sarah, in at five grand each, Lane, these are gonna be coming up, these need to be recognized, I know they're coming up. I'm waiting for them. And in between, I'm saying, come on, kids, let's go, let's fly. And it creates so much excitement and it helps push others to follow suit. Obviously, your fundraising auctioneer must be involved with this entire process because they need to know which names need to be recognized. Um, that's really important. All right, I got to move along.
I told you I'm squeezing in 5,000 words into 54 minutes. This is insane. All right, here we go. Run of show. Where do we place the fun and need? Never at the end, right? Never. Fundraising never goes at the end, even in an in-person event. If, if you've done your job right with marketing and communications, your, your guests are going to understand the purpose of this event. It's replacing your in-person signature event. Um, it is major fundraising. That's what they're called, going to be called upon to do. And finding the sweet spot is all about creating a run of show that is going to take your viewers on an emotional journey. You want them laughing and crying, okay, kids? You want them laughing and crying because that's what's going to keep them engaged. If you have a show host that's flat like that and boring video content and, and an auctioneer that's the an auctioneer that's like, hey, let's do this, uh, they're gone. It's going to be overnight, out, over and out, and good night, just like that. So, you know, we want to build um, the content really around the fund and need moment. You're running a show, build it around the fund and need because that really, this is going to be your money maker. This is your cause connect. This is the moment. This is where the moment where everybody can get on board. And please remember, a virtual gala is not an educational seminar. It is people still want social. They still want to feel all the feels. Don't just give them stats and statistics. Give them some entertainment. Give them some uh, feels. Give them uplifting. Take them on an emotional journey. Um, number of fun and neat segments. Hey, kids, you know what? Typical in-person gala, right? Typical in-person gala, you show up, you cocktail, you mocktail, uh, everybody sit down, okay, formal program, bite into your beef, uh, speaker, 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 bite into your shrimp, speaker, 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 blah, 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 live auction, fun and eat. Hey, we can break all the rules. We can topple the status quo. Nothing has to be the same when it comes to virtual. And guess what? I haven't done a virtual event without two fun and eats yet. Always two. And I started that right from the beginning. I said, why one? Why one? You don't know. You watch your viewership ebb and flow throughout the show. Remember about the dog that had the pee and the kids that are screaming? What if your viewer is sitting on that couch over there and the dog has to pee right now? They got to go. They're scratching at the door and it's right before the first fun and eat. There's going to be a second fun and eat. We're going to catch them on the second round. And you can tell two client stories. You can really uh, create a showcase moment in your virtual gala. Um, you have to balance your gala out too as well, okay? Just please remember that. Don't over solicit, you know those words, don't over solicit, don't keep asking, asking, asking. It's a raffle, it's an online, it's a this, it's a that, it's a that, 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 that. Keep it simple, focus on your donations. You can have a live auction if you want, nice uh, uh, cumulative uh, revenue. Um, but your fun and need is going to bring you way more dollars than your live auction ever will. Um, and that's what you should be focused on. Remember, fun and need is about getting, keeping, and growing your donors. Um, you want that data. You have a wider audience. You want to collect that data and steward those folks. This is about filling your donor pipeline beyond your geographical boundaries. And here's another cool thing. Here's another cool thing. I have data. Yes, I have data. I have done so many virtual galas now with two fund and need segments. I can tell you without a doubt, there are donors that give in segment one that do not give in segment two. There are donors that do not give in segment one, but give in segment two. And guess what? Mm -hmm. You're right. There are donors that double dip. <laughs> they give in both segments. Saturday night, I had a three time giver. She gave once in the first 1,000, then another 250, and then another 2,000 in the second segment. So it works, it works. Um, yeah, so anyways, that audience retention piece is key because you need to keep them throughout the entire show. Um, you know, we wanna keep them fully and great engaged. Um, so graphics, lower thirds, fast-paced program, entertainment, great host, great auctioneer, great content, rich visuals, dynamic and engaging. All right. Let's talk a little bit about your fundraising host, which is your charity auctioneer. 
Come on, guys, they have to connect and inspire a virtual audience. Um, they are crucial for the event flow, the dynamics, um, you know, the two fund and need moments really, you know, lay heavily on their shoulders because they will be strategizing with you in advance. They will be looking at your seed donors and saying, okay, I want this grouping in fund and need segment one. I want this grouping uh, preloaded in fund and need segment two. They need to, you know, they need to be able to connect to that virtual technology, watch that screen and make magic out of it. Make magic out of it and, and you know, get people excited and ramped up about getting involved and feeling amazing about giving a $20 gift. You know, people trust people and people support people. So when you think about the progression of the fund to need, you know, it, it's organization, client, then fundraising auctioneer. I am going to take that emotion from that client story and I am going to harness that and I am going to send continue to send that out into that virtual space. Um, you know, when it comes to fundraising in person, I'm sure you've seen the fund and need done by an auctioneer. It's usually done waterfall. We start at the top level and work our way down. <laughs> it doesn't work that way in virtual at all. It's like all over the map. So your fundraising host, your fundraising auctioneer has to know how to do virtual. It is not the same. Uh, it is nowhere near the same. You are alone. You saw that picture of me in studio. It's me and a camera, just like it is right now. How do you pull out the donations? How do you expire and, uh, you know, in, inspire people uh, to do that? You're not calling out levels. So there's no, there it's, it's, there's a 10, there's a 20, there's this, there's that. And you're watching the overall goal. So, you know, get your references, make sure they know how to do virtual, take a look at their virtual shows, make sure they're a good fit for your purposes and that they understand how to uh, interact with virtual guests and that fundraising technology. And they've got to be your ambassador. They have to know everything front and back about your organization. Because if I'm up there for six and seven minutes and there's a lull in the donations, what do you think I'm gonna talk about? My shirt, where I got it? How good my shoes are, my hair? Mm -mm. I'm gonna be talking about your organization, about why it's crucial that we raise funds right now and what the impact is and what that means for the community. And your auctioneer has to produce the results. Because if all the work is done in advance, the consulting, the pre-work, everybody's working together at a team, you're not going to fail. It's not possible. In 10 years of my career, I have never had a failed fund in need yet. And I've kept my statistics on that. So planning is very, very important. All right. So you've got all this good stuff. You've got your videos. You've got everything figured out. You've got the best auctioneer on the planet. Everything is great. Gosh. You got to let your guests know what's happening. You got to prime your guests about the fund and need for sure. Let them know in advance that they are going to be asked for donations. They need to be registered to bid and give. The last thing that you want is to get to the fund and need segment and people haven't been, they're not registered. And I, I start asking for money and it's like, wow, there's, there's like only the seed money's coming up. Wow, this is really bizarre. Can't have that. Your guests need to understand the purpose of the event. This is not just a party. This is your signature fundraiser. So that means fund and need specific e-blasts, uh, posting to your socials, uh, videos with your sponsors, videos with your matching donors, video vignettes of all, of all types. Leverage those sponsors. You know, um, you can have a, a sponsor uh, you know, come forth on a video and say, look, you know what? These are crazy times, kids, right? But we are not, and we will not stop supporting our charity because this is important to our community. We are standing beside them. We are not leaving their side. And we need you, everybody in this community, to dig deep, roll up your sleeves. And when it comes to the fund to need, give what you can because failure is not an option. Something like that. Um, the fundraising goal has to be clear and concise. Tonight, help us raise 100,000. In a week from now, help us raise 100,000. Clear, concise language in all communications. Open that fundraising site in advance. Get folks in there. Get them in there. Don't get them in there at seven o'clock or quarter to six. 
Start getting those registrations, get them there, drive them there, check out our online auction. It's opening, you know, five days before the, the event. Then they're going to scroll through. They're going to see the fund, uh, the fund and need uh, uh, section and how they can make a donation, get them comfortable with it. Um, one of the other ways uh, that you can pre-event prime guests is um, hosting those watch parties. I mean, last summer we were able to do that. COVID was kind of loosened up and opened up. And um, watch party hosts is we take it back to like that Benavon model of fundraising. Look, you look, you're coming to my house to watch the gala. Great, excellent. Um, uh, clean up your credit card debt because when you come to my house, um, we're all sitting in my living room and everybody's going to give. I want my household, my guests, to raise five thousand dollars tonight. That is the expectation. So that's another way to prime guests. Uh, pre-show, and when I talk about the pre-show, I mean literally the pre-show to the main event, that 12 minute timer where it's like, this is how to bid and, bid and register, register and bid. So you want those visual demonstrations. You want that, you know, this is where you go, go to www. and click here and register, put your email, put your telephone number, a few personal details, and you're ready to go. You're ready to bid and donate. So you want to make sure you're doing that. In the pre-show also, if you have entertainment, use those lower thirds. Use those lower thirds for the fundraising thermometer, for the honor roll, um, uh, the website where to register, the QR code. Uh, you've got to make sure your guests are registered to bid and donate before that fund and need hits. And in the main show, and I've hosted a lot of virtual galas, one of the first things I say is, if you haven't registered yet, we're gonna take a minute. Grab your phone right now, let's do it. Let's take a minute because our fund and need, our most critical fundraising segments are coming up. You need to be a part of it. I don't want anybody to miss out, so just do it. Let's just do it, let's just get it done. Um, every segment, again, is cause connected. This is why we're here. Our goal is to raise 100,000 because we need to do this. And even the entertainment, you know, even Sting can say, I want everybody to donate tonight. It's really important. Lane, back to you. Let's do this. You put that into the scripting. So there's this always this, this, this communication around the why we're here. Um, post event, uh, obviously, you know, uh, you can keep all that goodness going. Make sure you do all the right things. Listen, you're all development folks. You know what you need to do. Get those tax receipts out in seven to 10 days. Call the people. Do what you have to do. Um, don't ask them for more money a week later. Get those non-ask communications out. Show them how their dollars were spent. Show them the impact. Show them that shiny bus that was bought for the kids. Show that their dollars were directed to where you told them they were directed and make them feel good. People will remember that. And if you do that, next time you send out a direct mail eight months later and they lay out all their uh, Christmas direct mail in front of them, husband, wife, partners, whoever, they're saying, you know what? Don't remember that charity. Don't remember that charity. But this charity, I remember how they made me feel. They made me feel pretty darn special with a $20 gift at that virtual gala thing where I cried, right? So that is what you need to do. Right now, we're going to take a look at this case study. We're on the last leg of this. I have so much more to say, Emily. It's crazy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Georgian Bay General Hospital. I want to thank Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation for allowing me to share this information. It is public, uh, but they uh, have let me share this, and I have some really cool statistics to show you. I want to talk a little bit very quickly. This was our show flow. Uh, the pre-show was 12 minutes. Our main show was 41 minutes and 30 seconds. We had headline entertainment, Chantelle Kreviazuk, uh, Juno Award winner, Grammy winner. Um, we love her. I was the show host and the fundraising auctioneer. The cost to register, free, free, free. And our um, fundraising activations, we only did an online auction and we did two fund the need segments with uh, patient stories. Check this out. This is the budget line for fund the need. Budget was 150. Our actual raise was 204,628. That means we went $55,000 over 
target, which is amazing. And if any of my Georgian Bay Hospital Foundation friends are online, I love you. I'm still so proud of you. And um, we're getting ready for this year's virtual gala. We're going 100% virtual and we have an even greater uh, goal uh, than this. Uh, this was their first virtual gala and friends, this was their first ever fund in need. They had never ever done a strategic uh, donation ask at their per in-person event ever. So this was their first foray into fund and need. Um, and uh, you can see the results. Of course, I urged them and uh, said, you gotta get 75% of that seed money in advance. So let's take a little bit closer look at that. Um, that is their seed money. The first line is a $50,000 uh, matching gift uh, by a donor. And uh, this couple was absolutely lovely. Uh, we filmed an inspiring personal video message from them about why they wanted to give this gift, why they wanted to challenge the community to match it and the importance of it. They, they were so darn cute. Um, they really set the tone. They're just so genuine. Um, you can see that the foundation had 25 pre-committed donations, 135,200, that's 86% of goal in the can before we even started. Um, they prospected uh, previous event sponsors, previous event sponsor prospects, previous event ticket and table purchasers, previous live auction item purchasers. So those are the folks that have like the five, six, seven, ten thousand $10,000. Previous event donors, previous event donor prospects and donors in their database that might support this fund a need initiative. Obviously you need to know your donors. And, um, you know, we talked about all levels, all levels are important. So, you know, we really, set the bar high. We divided these 25 gifts into each fund and need segment and we preloaded it into the fundraising platform. All these gifts required uh, verbal recognition. And I had a list of these names uh, in hand or I had it on a prompter. So I knew when they would be coming up, segment one or segment two, I knew which segment they were assigned to. Uh, Nicole Krafchek, the executive director of the foundation was in studio with me. And, you know, if, and I get really intense. I get, I get really, really into it. So, you know, she was marking off, okay, Lane said John, Lane said Mary, Lane said Trudy. Um, when I got off stage, she actually gave me the list of which names maybe didn't hit the the uh, hit the uh, screen. Uh, maybe there were other gifts coming in at the time. Maybe there was a queue. I, I don't know, uh, or it was too fast. But we made sure we captured because what I did is when I started the second fundraising segment, I said. <gasps> While I was off having a drink of water and a, and a goat cheese smoothie, um, these donations came in. And let me say thank you to, you know, uh, Emily and Justin and, and Daniel. And so we made sure that we captured everything. And in fact, we got so intense about capturing names that uh, the GBGHF team actually watched that back end. They were watching for other donations that were coming in while other moments in the show were going on and gave me a list at the end of the night saying, these ones need verbal recognition too. If you don't think that those folks felt incredibly special, well, I'm telling you that they did. And I can tell you that the, some of these large gifts uh, certainly inspired other li uh, large gifts. So very, very important. So let's look at how many gifts were made during the event. Jeez, I got five minutes. Um, there were 90, uh, 90 gifts made during the event. 62 of those were new donors. The average gift during the event was 741 bucks. That's, that's huge. That's Huge, first time fund a need, first time virtual, an average gift, 741 bucks. 
That's insane. That is incredible. And if you really take a look at this chart in detail, you can see that the $1,000 gifts plus and up is 10 gifts. And those 10 gifts uh, added up to over $52,000. And I love that there were gifts in there for 300, for uh, 2,100. I mean, we had five preset amounts, but people were giving numbers that were meaningful for them. I, I've got to move along here. These are the watch party results. We had five watch parties uh, and uh, the watch parties raised what, like 20, 29,000 bucks, something like that, five watch parties. Um, this turns my crank so much, I can't even tell you. It excites me beyond um, because these are VIPs, champions of the foundation, really taking a leadership role, inviting folks to their home that know have capacity to give um, and, and really just lay it out there and saying, you know what, you're coming to my house and you're, you're, you're dropping some dough for the foundation. That's just how it's gonna roll. So really, really wonderful. Uh, very, very exciting. So coming down to the end of our uh, webinar here, um, you know, determining the actual percentage of virtual audience who gives is kind of hard at times, right? Because um, somebody might buy a ticket uh, and I might invite other people to come in. So maybe one ticket could represent three or four or six viewers, depending on where we are in COVID, right? So, um, you know, the KPIs that we're always looking at, my team is always looking at, I'm looking at is what are the number of gifts to the population in the room or what we think we had virtually, the percentage of the audience who gave, what the average gift size is, number of new donors, and how do we drive those numbers up the following year. If you found this information interesting, um, the gift charts and so on and so forth, if you go to my website, um, you will find a, a full uh, recorded version of the virtual gala, the GBGHF virtual gala. We also did a learning event um, uh, where we shared a full case study. There's a downloadable case study. Um, if you like this kind of information, please head there. And one more thing that I want to mention is that the uh, Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation had maybe you know, 150, 200 views on event night. Um, if you look them up right now on YouTube, it's over 1,500, 1,500. So wow, what an opportunity for sponsors as well. Um, so just think about that also. All right, <laughs> I'm at the end. And before we do Smith and we talk about Smith, Emily, um, you have like 10 seconds to give me a question. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. Uh, apologies. I managed to, to tech myself out of my video classic, but luckily you can still hear me for this question. So I wanted to combine a question that we got with Jenny with a different question uh, into when you're trying to prep your guests for a virtual event to make sure that they are very engaged during the night what are some marketing approaches you can do beforehand to prime your guests for the virtual fund and need? Um, well, I think we touched upon those uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I do a lot is I do short vignette videos. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly well known in, in Ontario and Canada. So, you know, I will do some short promo videos for my clients and say, I can't wait to be together with you. And we're going to, we're going to knock, knock this out of the ballpark. Our goal is a hundred thousand. So getting a lot of people love video content. So the e-blast thing, you, you know, it, it can be effective to a certain degree, but people love video. So get your sponsors on board leverage them, um, uh, leverage your, um, you know, your auction committee, your CEO, your, your directors, um, get them all uh, online doing lives or uh, doing video vignettes, talking about the fund and need uh, in advance. I mean, you have to put it out there. Um, otherwise people won't know. Uh, <laughs> audience engagement also has to do with what's going to be happening in the show. People, remember something, people go to live in-person events. They don't go to give money. That is not the number one reason why they attend fundraising galas. The number one reason they go to a fundraising gala is to socialize and have fun. 
So if you uh, put together a very, uh, you know, a dynamic show with lots of surprise and delights, um, you know, get people pumped up, whether that's, you know, sending out swag bags with a rave card inside that talks about the fun to need or, um, you know, uh, talking about the entertainment that you're going to have and how great this experience is going to be. If you put it down to the experience also, that will also get more people on board saying, hey, this is going to be a really fun and special night. Wow, that's awesome, Lynn. Um, before you ask the, the people that are here, I want to jump in because I know you're about to ask people their single most important takeaway, I believe is the acronym. And I really wanted to share mine. Uh, and one thing that you like kind of set it off the, the side of your tongue, but you had said, show donors the bus they bought. And I think that's such an important piece. People like, like you do with your charities, talk so much about, okay, what can we do beforehand? What can we do during? But there's that special piece afterwards of, hey, if you want to make sure all those people come back and are really excited to go and maybe give more even the next year, show them the look on those kids' face when they get their new yellow bus. I think that was just fantastic. Thank you. That's right. So uh, single most important takeaway, single most important thing. Emily, can I wrap it up now? Or do you have another yeah. question? Um, so there's no more questions. If anyone has questions, I will be following up with an email and I'll make sure to put Lane's website link in there. They have a fantastic website, so you can find them really easily to ask any more questions that you have. Lane, if you don't mind just going to the final slide so that I can show everyone what is coming up next or two weeks from now, actually, I've just popped the link into the chat here. So in two weeks from now, we are gonna host another webinar with Drew Vincent from Stay At Home Fundraising. And he is gonna be talking about how to create record engagement specifically with hybrid events. So we had a question come up about this earlier. This is something that depending on where you are and depending on what hybrid looks like to you um, might be something that, that we see this year. So if you're interested on figuring out how to engage the virtual, the in-person and that mix, uh, that's a fantastic webinar for you to join. Excellent. So shall I tell them what the offer is now? I think you shall. Okay, I'm going to. So, all right, for everybody that's participating today, head on over to my website. Let me know what your SMIT was from today and the date of your virtual gala. If anyone who's participating today engages my virtual gala services for 2021, I will give your charity a 15% charitable donation based on the pre-tax uh, total of services. Wow, that is so awesome. Uh, if I can speak for myself, <laughs> I wish that I had a charity that I could go and talk to Lane with about this on uh, because in just an hour, I feel like I have an incredible amount of takeaways and I had already seen this slide deck multiple times. <laughs> so that really says a lot. So thank you so much, Lane. We were so, so thankful to have you on our webinar because I know that a ton of people got a lot of value out of this. So please reach out to Lane. Trish has passed on her thanks to you as well, Lane. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Trish, for joining us. Uh, Lane, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.